So which of these is true? I think stands or falls upon the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Who do you think Jesus of Nazareth was? Jesus claimed to be the decisive self-revelation of God. And I believe that we have good reasons to believe that those claims were true and that therefore the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth exists. Okay, so let's let's get into that. Okay. Uh, so what are what are what is the proof that Jesus was who he says he is in in the Gospels? Well, first we need to establish who he thought he was. When you look at the religio historical context uh, of the life and ministry of Jesus, I think you can show that among the historically authentic words of Jesus were claims that he thought he was the Jewish Messiah that he believed himself to be the son of God in a unique sense that set him apart from Jewish kings and prophets. And finally, that he thought that he was the son of man predicted by the prophet Daniel, to whom God would give all dominion, power, and authority. So he had this radical self-understanding of being Messiah, son of God, and the Son of Man. And at the trial scene before the Sanhedrin in Mark 15, all three of these titles come to a head when the high priest asks him, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One, that is the Son of God? And Jesus says, I am. And then virtually quoting from Daniel, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven and seated at the right hand of the power. And at that point, the high priest rips his robes and says, you have heard the blasphemy. What more witnesses do we need? And Mark says, they all condemned him as worthy of death. And that enabled them, since they didn't have the ability to carry out capital punishment, to deliver him over to the Roman authorities by slandering him as a pretender to be king of the Jews and therefore a a, a political figure who could be tried for treason and sedition and crucified. So from the Jewish perspective, this this narrative has some some holes in sort of Jewish philosophy. Uh, The the narrative begins with the idea that Jesus appears in front of the Sanhedrin and then claims to be the Messiah. Well, there's nothing actual criminally in in any of the tractates that say that if you declare yourself the Messiah, this is actually a punishment, a punishable offense, even. Right. That, there, there are many Jews, including Bar Kokhba, who have declared themselves messianic figures. Absolutely. The, the real gap here is that in the Gospels, Jesus' vision of himself as the Messiah is completely different from the prior vision of what the Jewish Messiah is and is actually outside the scope of how Jews describe the Messiah or really have ever described the Messiah. The Messiah in Judaism has always been a political figure who is destined to do certain things, restoring yeah. the kingdom of Israel, uh, re- maintaining control of that kingdom, uh, bringing more Jews back to Israel. All of these things are considered sort of political things that the Messiah does. But the idea of the Messiah as embodiment of God is something that's foreign to Jewish religious mm-hmm. philosophy going all the way back to the beginning. So even the idea that the Sanhedrin would be questioning him in those terms and would get from that, that what he means is, I am God, which would be a much more punishable offense, presumably that would be uh-huh. actual blasphemy. That, that's, it's, it's an oddity. I think you're absolutely right in saying that Jesus' understanding of the Messiah was radically different from the prevailing um, cultural understanding of the Messiah among the chief priests and the common people. And he didn't meet their expectations. Indeed, that's what helped to get him crucified. Being the Messiah, you're right, in and of itself isn't a blasphemous claim. But to claim to be the Son of God in a unique sense, and then especially the Son of Man prophesied by Daniel, sitting at the right hand of the power, that is truly blasphemous and is sufficient for his condemnation. Now, the question, I think, that is raised by your interpretation, question, ben, yes. yeah, your interpretation mm-hmm. Ben, is this. Why should we believe Jesus, reinterpretation of the Messiah rather than the one that the chief priests and the people held. And I think the answer to that is his resurrection from the dead. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is 
Yahweh's public and unequivocal vindication of the man whom the chief priests had rejected as a blasphemer. It is the divine demonstration that these allegedly blasphemous claims are in fact true, that he was who he claimed to be, uh, and that therefore I follow Jesus in his conception of what it means to be the Messiah. So when it comes to the resurrection, why is resurrection proof of divinity? So Lazarus is, is resurrected. Uh, that was why I wanted to emphasize the religio-historical context before we talked about the resurrection. A miracle taken in isolation is inherently ambiguous. The proper interpretation of a miracle is going to be given by the religio-historical context in which it occurs. And the resurrection of Jesus is not just the resurrection of any old body. It's the resurrection of the man who claimed to be Messiah, Son of God, and Son of Man, and, and who was crucified for those allegedly blasphemous claims. If God has raised this man from the dead, then he has, I think, unequivocally and publicly vindicated those allegedly blasphemous claims. So one of the counterclaims to some of this is that the Gospels are written significantly after Jesus lives. Even the earliest Gospel is written, what, 70 CE? Uh, some, somewhere, in, somewhere 40 years after, mm -hmm. after Jesus is crucified. So what's to say, I mean, that like most historical events, there is some play in the joints here. So that this would be the historical argument against the exact veracity of, of the gospel oh. revelations, for well, example. I, now, I think it's important to understand, Ben, that in order for a historical document to be reliable, it isn't required that it be in error. Contemporaneous, of course. So, of course. Um, what I would argue is that underlying the inference to the resurrection of Jesus are three great independently established facts which are supported by the historical evidence, uh, and which surprisingly, I did my doctoral work on this in Germany, uh, are, are recognized as such by the majority of New Testament scholars today who studied the historical Jesus. And these facts would be that after his crucifixion um, uh, and, and burial by a member of the Sanhedrin named Joseph of Arimathea, that Jesus' tomb was discovered empty on the first day of the week by a group of his female followers. Secondly would be that various individuals and groups of people then witnessed appearances of Jesus alive. And finally, number three would be that the original disciple suddenly and sincerely came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead despite having every predisposition to the contrary. The vast majority of scholars have come to accept as convincing the evidence in support of those three facts, not assuming biblical inerrancy or inspiration, but treating the Gospels as ordinary historical documents. You can show, for example, that the fact of the discovery of the empty tomb is attested by at least six independent sources in the New Testament, some of which are extraordinarily early. No scholar denies that individuals and groups saw postmortem appearances of Jesus. The only question is whether you should or could dismiss them as hallucinatory. And again, nobody denies that the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead. So these three facts are pretty firmly established, and the only question is then how do you best explain them? And down through history, attempts have been made to explain these facts without recourse to the resurrection, like the conspiracy theory, the apparent death theory, uh, the hallucination theory, and so forth. And I would argue that none of these naturalistic theories meets the criteria for being the best historical explanation of the facts. None of them is as good an explanation as the one that the original disciples gave, that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if that's right, then I think we have good grounds, indeed are almost compelled, to revise our typical understanding of who the Messiah was supposed to be. So we can have the historical argument back and forth, obviously, and I think that there are 
arguments that you can make. I think there are arguments that I can make, but I, I honestly yes. find them relatively uninteresting is the truth, um, simply because I'm not sure that we're going to come to any sort of consensus on them. No. You know, on the, on the historical argument, for example, I think it's fairly easy to claim there's, there's a sect of Judaism right now uh, in which there's a sub, small subsection of people who believe that the Lubavitcher Rebbe is still alive. Right, the Lubavitcher Rebbe uh -huh. passed away in the, in the 1990s. Yes, yes. And there's still people who, who treat him as though he is not dead. Uh, they, they call him the Messiah. They think that yes. he was the political Messiah. Uh, they have, and, and they still do that 20 years after his death. You know, that's not proof to me that he is actually alive. Some of them claim Nor to have experience. It, right. So, uh, you know, especially when you're talking about events 2,000 years ago, yeah. uh, if people write that down, I think there's sufficient... I doubt this man's tomb is empty. I mean... I haven't dug him up, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wouldn't know. But uh, the yeah. the claims, if somebody claimed 2,000 years from now that his tomb was empty or claimed 70 years from now that his tomb was empty, then... Yeah, that's that an important difference, Ben. The important time gap is not the gap between the events and the present. Um, good evidence doesn't become bad evidence just because of the lapse of time. The critical event, as you just said, is the time gap between the events and the recording of those Correct. events. And in the case of the events of the life of Jesus and his resurrection, that time gap is extraordinarily narrow. We can push back even before the writing of the Gospels and the epistles of Paul by discerning the traditions upon which they relied when they wrote and some of these go back to within, it's estimated, five years after Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, I'm thinking of the ones that Paul transmits in to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15. So we're on pretty good ground there in terms of the earliness and the multiplicity of our sources for the life of Jesus. So let's talk for a second about sort of the necessity for Judeo-Christian revelation, because and here I'm going to merge the two in terms of the idea of God personally speaking to people and giving them the morality of the Old Testament, which mm. largely is reflected in the New Testament. Uh, and the New Testament is part of the Old Testament, according to Christians anyway. It reflects the, the chief morality of the Old Testament. It doesn't su supplant it entirely. The Old Testament right. doesn't become a nothing just because the New Testament I comes agree. around. So that's why I'm now moving back toward the kind of theological question, which is, what's the purpose of the revelation? Meaning, could we, would it be sufficient to work within the framework of the first half of our conversation with regard to sort of rational pushes, not toward revelation and, and the presence of God in human form in Christianity or the presence of God on top of a mountain in Judaism? Would a God of reason alone be sufficient? Or do you need to have, for what purpose uh, do you need to have a God who is speaking directly to people at Sinai or speaking through Jesus in Christianity? I think that the answer of both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament can be put into one word, atonement. What is needed is atonement for sin. And in the Levitical sacrifices, in the tabernacle and later in the temple, you had a sacrificial system whereby atonement was made for sin through the sacrifice of various animals. And Jesus himself and the authors of the New Testament think of Jesus as being the ultimate sacrificial offering to God to make atonement once and for all for the sins of mankind. So that in his sacrificial death on the cross, he fulfills all of these um, Jewish antecedents or foreshadowing of a decisive atonement for sin that will reconcile us to God and bring forgiveness and, and pardon and cleansing. 